All right, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Claire Jantz. I am the director for the Center for Land Use and Sustainability here at Shippensburg University. Um, and this is the second in our uh, climate change forum series. Um, tonight, as you can see, we're gonna be talking about impacts on forestry and wildlife. Um, the, the CLUS wanted to launch this series because um, climate change has been big topic in the media. Uh, many of us are experiencing the effects of it um, now. So, uh, so there's a, 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 an increased concern about it. And we wanted to try to um, relate it to uh, our everyday lives. So our, in, our, in our last forum, which is available, um, the video is available up on our website. Um, so you can, you can catch up if you missed it, uh, focused on sort of an introduction to climate change with a focus on what's happening here locally. Um, today, we're gonna be hearing about um, some of the impacts on, on our local forests and wildlife. And the reason we wanted to focus on this topic in particular is because to our north and west, we have the Kittatinny Ridge, um, where, which is a globally import, important bird area, uh, largely for, for migratory birds, but it's certainly a hotspot for for biodiversity, um, for recreation, for hunting, hiking, for clean water. To our south and east, we have uh, South Mountain, um, which uh, in the Michaux State Forest, they're in the midst of a turkey and ruffed grouse uh, habitat restoration plan. Um, the Michaux State Forest has also been targeted um, by the DCNR as a pilot for the DCNR's climate adaptation and mitigation program. So, uh, so in our region, land managers are dealing with these issues uh, right now. So we're really excited to have Dr. Ben Jones join us today. Um, Dr. Jones is the president and CEO of the American Rough Grouse Association and the American Woodco Woodcock Society, um, but he uh, has a decades-long career in um, science-based wildlife management and conservation. Um, he was previously uh, spent some time at the Game Commission here in Pennsylvania, and my colleagues um, at DCNR and the Game Commission have spoken very highly of him. So uh, we're really excited that he is here to, uh, to share his knowledge um, and to tell us about how uh, local um, species um, and animals and forests are adapting or not adapting to climate change. Um, one thing, just kind of housekeeping, for those of you who are joining us online, um, you do have access to the chat and we are monitoring the chat. So if you have issues with um, sound quality or video, please let us know. And if you um, have questions, also please let us know. We will have time for Q&A at the end and we wanna engage um, folks who are online as well as folks who are here in the room. So I'm gonna pass the mic to you, Dr. Jones. You know, I get to run around. You know, I, I can't get the camera to come back up. Oh. Onto the, I mean, you're being filmed. Everybody is watching us right now. But we still have sound on the online. Actually, thing. no, no, no. This is it. I got it. You got it. So now people who are online can see you and hear you. All right. Okay, I'm just gonna get this down in the corner so it's out of the way. All right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a disaster. Thank you, Ben. This is a uh, amateur hour, obviously. So can our online viewers and listeners is there a chat room where they can put questions mm -hmm. in at any point? Were they letting you know it's not on the screen share? Yeah, they were like, come on, guys. That's a good, yeah. Get it together. I thought I had it. I thought I was doing so good. And, uh, 
Okay, are they happy now? Everyone checking out? Well, the icon is up there. This is what you're supposed to do. I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I think we're okay, right? Okay. Yeah. It will go. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Sorry about that. We, yeah. Well, thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Good to be with you all in the room, and of course, you all online as well. This is this is a pretty brand new presentation for me. Over several decades of doing um, lots of speaking about forestry and wildlife issues, this one's relatively new. Uh, actually, you're the first one to get this in its current form, and that's because this is really. I don't want to say it's an emerging issue because we've been talking about climate change for quite some time. But the thing that has recently changed is the, the public's receptivity to hear about climate change. It seems like in the last six or eight months or so that uh, we're seeing less of kind of the straight climate denial and people are, are more willing now, it seems, to engage uh, to the point that um, just eight months ago, uh, would have been kind of perilous for me and within our group, the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society, to have a presentation about climate change. A little bit more about that, or at least to call it such. We could talk about changing conditions or warming environments, but uh, by God, we've got to outright say it, climate change, because it is the biggest issue that will face us conservation-wise. So in talking about conservation and forestry and wildlife, I framed this question. And it's a really relevant one. We had a, a meeting among groups, Ducks Unlimited, other conservation groups, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Wildlife Management Institute this summer to talk about how sportsmen's groups, hunting founded groups, would respond to discussions about climate change. So a word quickly about the Rough Grouse Society, and this is an old logo. Our branding people wouldn't probably like to see this one, but it's one from when I was a kid and one I remember seeing. And can any of you who are from Pennsylvania pick out the artist? It's relevant to Pennsylvania, Millersburg specifically. That's a Ned Smith sketch they did for the Rough Grouse Society. And um, the Rough Grouse Society was established almost 60 years ago, and it, it was put together by a group of hunters and conservationists and people who were interested in forest conservation. And this really was the founding of the conservation movement. Hunters were the, some of the first conservationists, if you look back to Gifford Pinchot and of course Theodore Roosevelt, at the response to quickly dwindling populations of wildlife, it was hunters who founded this conservation movement. So again, it's important to ask this question, will those same groups continue forward with the conservation challenges that we have ahead of us with climate change now. And this was a, a, a quote I found from our organization's first president. For all of us, it was a labor of love. Uh, and that's what it means for hunters who started conservation groups and are, that are involved in these issues. Uh, it isn't just about the hunt or bagging game. It really is that passion for the outdoors and for the resources. And uh, certainly it remains so today after nearly 60 years. So today, I, I guess to summarize what the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society, what we do is uh, uniting conservationists to improve wildlife habitat and forest health. So as an individual, um, you can't call the Game Commission and work on a habitat project as an individual. But as a member of the Rough Grouse Society with several thousand other members uh, in Pennsylvania and around the region, uh, then you can have a collective voice and work on habitat projects. So that's how we talk about what we do, uniting conservationists to do some of that forest and wildlife work. And uh, though there's a single species in our name, the rough grouse, we think of the rough grouse as really our flagship 
because they're a bellwether of forest health. This is a non-migratory forest dependent bird and their populations and the health of rough grouse tells us a lot about the health of our forest. So it's not just about rough grouse, it's about whole, whole suites of other wildlife from turkeys to prairie warblers, uh, whippoorwills that depend on those same healthy forest habitats. And within the rough grouse society and a lot of conservation groups, um, we are science-based. So whatever we're working on, whether it's promoting sustainable habitat management or educating stakeholders or commenting on regulatory or policy changes, or uh, advocating for sound public policies and conservation and forest management, the first question we're always going to ask as a group is what does the science say? That is really the tenet we've hung our hat on over the decades. What does the science tell us? And any of our commentary on these above issues here are gonna lend back to, we support science-based sustainable wildlife and forest management. And as such, we've had a lot of, uh, over the past five, six decades, a lot of work has been done. Advances, great advances have been made in our understanding through wildlife science and forest science. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on the Appalachian Cooperative Grouse Research Project. This at the time, uh, late 90s through early 2000s, was the largest cooperative wildlife research project that was ever undertaken. So um, we've gotten a lot of science over the years and we use that science to support our positions. So what's our hang up with this science? When I think about the scope and the breadth of climate science that we have. As a wildlife biologist, it's actually enviable. If we had science that was this strong in, in wildlife and forestry, it would make our jobs a lot easier. That's, that's pretty stark science. If I could get similar things to tell me how forests behave or how wildlife populations behave, um, I'd be very pleased with it. So we have very good science telling us about climate. And of course, uh, this has kind of been this idea, well, the, the whole human cause and climate change has always occurred across the history of the earth. It's always been our kind of, yeah, well, of course we support science, but kind of fall back a little bit into a safe place. We're just going to blow that up here. Uh, was able to, to spend some time with uh, Bill Hohenstein this summer, uh, works in USDA brilliant scientists, that whole climate science team in USDA is just a brilliant bunch of individuals. And so these are all those natural factors in climate change we hear about, volcanic, solar, orbital, and indeed, we've seen them change climate over time. The black line here is what we've been observing. And we can go one step further with that. Now let's track the human drivers in climate and see what's really moving this. And we can, I think, get out of this discussion about whether um, we're just seeing some uh, natural occurrences that have happened uh, over history. Uh, clearly, we're seeing unprecedented changes in the lab. Again, really strong science. When you talk about correlation values and statistics, I mean, there, there really isn't much available debate on this from just the pure science end of it. And I guess just to, to beat that a little further, you've got 80 national academies of science that are supporting this research. So point being, as groups that support scientific management, this is science that we really do need to embrace. And uh, climate science has really taken a center stage in wildlife management over the past decades. Whether you're interested in white-tailed deer or uh, breeding birds, neotropical migrants, uh, bats, migratory waterfowl. Climate is becoming a big driver. The um, push and changes we're seeing in these populations and habitat use and uh, in the focus of research. So talk a bit about uh, wildlife specifically. So around 2005, this was actually as I was coming in the door with the Pennsylvania Game Commission, in 2005 after being involved with the grouse project I was working in North Carolina. Around that time, the US Fish and Wildlife Service went to every state wildlife agency 
and required them to write a state wildlife action plan. And each state then was supposed to develop what came to be called their blueprint, their comprehensive wildlife conservation strategy. And it was to identify species of greatest conservation need in each state and the key habit habitats that they depend on. So the state wildlife action plans really became key for wildlife and uh, habitat management. This is our current state wildlife action plan here in Pennsylvania. And around 2009, lending again to the importance of addressing climate issues, around 2009, uh, once everybody had their first draft of a state wildlife action plan and the US Fish and Wildlife Service said, okay, by the way, uh, now also put an addendum in there talking about some of the issues that you may have to address relevant to climate. So really important when we're looking at wildlife and habitat management. I have no idea what I have that slide in there for. <laughs> it, it tied in somehow, I'm sure. But back to state wildlife action plans. And again, I think what we have with this bellwether, ruffed grouse, isn't just a species, but it's a teachable species that represents things that are going on with a lot of other wildlife that use the same types of habitat. So what we have here are ruffed grouse, uh, a once very common uh, bird across its range, hunted. Um, it is listed in 18 state wildlife action plans as a species of greatest conservation need at this point. And in the state of Indiana, a place where again, uh, throughout the 1980s, tens of thousands of rough grouse were harvested legally by hunters. They had a great sustainable population there. Uh, the state of Indiana moved last November to list rough grouse as state endangered. So these declines are real and they're being noted uh, across 18, 19 different states. So, I said a moment ago that rough grouse present kind of a teachable opportunity about the effects of climate change on wildlife. And this is rough grouse natural distribution across North America. And the really interesting thing here is they're pretty much a northern species. They need cold winters, colder climates. But you'll see here they exist way down into Georgia. Why can, how can they exist into Georgia? Any cold places in Georgia? Yeah, it's related to elevation. So you do have northerly type climates, even down through the southern Appalachians and the southern Blue Ridge. Where I worked on rough grouse was right here in western North Carolina, and uh, it was at high elevation. So you have more northerly climates further south because of elevation. So it makes sense that any changes in that climate, you're going to see some real sensitivity in the southern parts of their range. Uh, here's where I worked in, in Western North Carolina. And prior to that, I'd worked in Mississippi, and, but I'm originally from Pennsylvania. So I was happy to get back to mountains. And they reminded me a lot of home. Uh, we had seasons unlike Mississippi where it's just kind of hot. And again, above 3,000 feet, it was winter. In fact, I would leave our house at times, which was about 1,900 feet elevation heading up onto my study site. And once you hit about 3,000 feet, you might have 18 inches of snow where it was raining down at the house. So these are the places in the deep uh, southern Appalachians where rough grass persists. And snow is important um, for this species because they, they do something called snow roosting. In fact, this has been really closely tied to overwinter survival. And what they'll do, and what you're looking at right here, is you have a nice fluffy 18 inch snow, rough grouse will dive into that snow bank and burrow in there over the night. It offers protection from predators, but it also offers thermal protection, kind of like sleeping in an igloo. Uh, and then the next morning they get up and what happened here, they crawl out and you can see the wing marks where they flew out. So snow, snow depth is really closely tied to rough grouse over winter survival. So think about snows that we've had here recently also happening in places like Minnesota, Michigan. Do you have a nice fluffy snow for a long time? Or do you get these things where it snows a good bit and then it gets caked up with ice? Yeah, well, that's one of the climate differences that we're definitely seeing. Less snow for one and less prolonged periods of deep fluffy snow. 
Here's another tie that we have uh, with climate. Recently, and the work was uh, groundbreaking work was done here in Pennsylvania with rough grouse declines. West Nile virus has caused an issue with them. Of course, we saw complete collapses in crow and jay populations from West Nile virus. And when uh, we started seeing some declines in rough grouse populations, it didn't make sense. Lisa Williams, our state uh, rough grouse biologist here, started doing some work. And sure enough, our, our grouse were carrying West Nile and it was impacting them. Well, not just any skeeters either, but these Kulex mosquitoes are carriers of West Nile and they really like to bite birds. Lo and behold, the two species of Kulex mosquitoes that have been on the increase, that increase has been directly, direct, directly related to longer, warmer temperatures, longer, warmer, wetter periods. So warmer, longer summers is favoring Kulex mosquito, mosquitoes, the same critter that carries West Nile virus. So again, with rough grouse being kind of this teachable species, we don't have these complex interactions between, okay, this happens with climate, and then it trickles down to this, then it's over here like this, and that's what impacts rough grouse. It's pretty direct. Climate change, less snow, less deep fluffy snows for long periods, direct impact to grouse. Climate change, more Kulix mosquitoes, more West Nile virus, direct impact, impact for rough grouse. So we don't have to use our imagination with why a lot of this would be happening. And this is just an example of uh, the bird on the left with West Nile virus. You can see emaciated, really stressed versus the healthy bird on the right. And Audubon a few years ago did some really interesting modeling. If you go to Audubon's website, Google search something like climate, Audubon climate bird map or something like that. You can do these for many different species and it's fascinating. So here's the one for the species in question. Uh, here, and here's our time lapse right here, 2000. And this is that same distribution we saw just a little bit ago, 2000, 2020, 2050, to the point in 2080, we don't really even have rough grouse populations left in uh, the eastern lower 48 where we once would have had them all the way down in to North Georgia. And the scary part about this is it starts in 2000, so we're approaching 2020, and this is exactly what we're seeing, especially in those Southern Appalachian populations where their range is contracting. And so over time, you see this just kind of going up like smoke and moving north. So again, to the point that it is really a, a teachable a teachable critter. So um, I was mentioned at the outset that the Michaud, other organizations, the Game Commission, DCNR, state forestry and wildlife agencies all over the country are, are working on some uh, resiliency adaptation work. How do we manage for wildlife in the presence of climate change and these new stressors, things like West Nile virus? And this of course is one of our many beautiful vistas of conserved land here in Pennsylvania. This one is just north of State College. Uh, I think most of this is probably Sproul and Tioga State Forest. But when I stop at these overlooks or I'm driving down Interstate 80 or I'm on the turnpike looking at the Kittatinny Ridge or driving down across South Mountain, there's something actually wrong with this landscape. It's fantastic that it's conserved in forest. But there's actually something kind of wrong with it from a forest health perspective. Does anybody have any idea what it is? Yeah, somebody here said it. It's all the same age. It's a single aged forest. All those tree canopies are the same height. It lacks age diversity. Uh, in some respects, it lacks, lacks species diversity. But this is not historically, and if I could do one thing, it would be to go to like 1350 and stand at the same vista and see structurally what this forest would have looked like then. It would have been very diverse, very patchy. We had fires, beavers, um, migrating herds of bison. It would have been a very diverse landscape. And now you look at it, it's just kind of all painted with the same brush. And we painted it with that brush. So give or take 20-ish years of 1900, uh, the overexploitation area at the same time when wildlife were being market hunted to near extinction, we were also um, 
cutting the snot out of all our forests. Complete, clear, uh, indiscriminate cutting, a couple waves worth of it, as you can see here. And this actually gave birth to the conservation movement, which, uh, which was a good thing. Um, but what we're seeing now with this single aged forest, so we conserved these lands, we actually quit letting fires burn too, which now we're learning wasn't such a great thing. But the result then is the same landscape as all single aged forests that started growing back at this time. That's another one, that's up near uh, Vernova. But again, you can see single aged forests across the landscape. And um, when we were doing our planning in the Game Commission and the DCR has the same thing, looking at their 2.1 million acres of state forests, million and a half acres of state game lands. You're really blessed here with a, a lot of really fine state ground, about 4 million or so acres of state uh, publicly open land. But uh, time and again, when we were working through game lands plans, we would look at the forest age classes. So young forest, young middle, a middle-aged forest, really old forest we've got a really skewed distribution because of what happened in the past. Just another way to look at that in different successional states that are all very important for wildlife, the biggest chunk of the pie is right there. And uh, 80, about 80 to 125 people. So let's think about this from the context of uh, mitigating climate change, not just from a habitat diversity issue. But this is also something that over the past months has really taken off in the general public communications that forests are going to be really important for us to mitigate and it seems if there's any hope we're going to curb climate change together with reduced emissions we're going to need forests and we're going to need huge increases in forests to start sucking out some of that carbon out and sequestering it. So a couple interesting things here forests offset currently about 12% of total U.S. emissions. Um, this is interesting, the annual, annual carbon sequestration by forests has decreased by about almost 6% since 1990. So this then too is a function of that aging forest, a single aged forest that's getting toward 100 years old, its growth rates are slowing down considerably, trees are starting to die and it's carbon sequestering ability is going down. It's storing a lot of carbon, but it's the rate at which it's sequestering more carbon is starting to decrease. So we've got some forest health issues, but indeed forests are going to be key uh, when we're talking about curbing climate. So this is what we're going to talk about for the next hour. Who's <laughs> <laughs> down with that? And, and I, the next couple of slides I did um, borrow from a forest service presentation but it is complex and you start looking at cli the climate math or the carbon math and it's extremely complex but in efforts to boil it down this really comes down to a few key slides and this is from Chaley Hoover with the Forest Service Northern Research Station out of New Hampshire and she just sets this up perfectly so what do we really know about forests and how they store carbon well young forests have little carbon in them, but they grow quickly. So fast growth means they're storing carbon at a really high rate. So in a young forest, they're growing like crazy. They're not storing much, but they're really sequestering a lot of carbon to aid in their growth. Old forests have a lot of, a lot of carbon stored up, but they're not sequestering carbon as quickly as the younger forests. So again, this lends us really to that point of we need increased diversity across the landscape. So another good reason to plan for a range of age classes across the landscape. And when we talk about resiliency and adaptation, so we, hopefully it's clear to you, we've got these new pressures that are coming on wildlife, new diseases, changes in uh, weather patterns, and specific to rough grouse, we've got West Nile virus, decreased snow depth, if there's any hope for resiliency, especially in southern parts of their range, we're going to have to have really good habitat to make them more resilient. And in fact, here in Pennsylvania, they're showing that after some years, West Nile isn't so bad as other years. And after a bad West Nile year in Pennsylvania, rough grass populations increase much more quickly in areas of good habitat 
compared to areas of poor habitat where they continue to decline. So some areas of good habitat, um, sustainably managed forest areas in northwestern Pennsylvania, for example, after West Nile, those populations can increase. Uh, areas like the Michelle, you see that population continue to decline, hence the reason for the restoration work that they're working on on that forest and others across the state. So we really need to be able to inter intersperse some diversity across this unnatural uh, even age landscape. And this is something what that might look like. So those first vistas we were looking at, just single height canopies, uh, a landscape that looks like this is just a carbon sequestering machine. You've got some young forest, you've got some old forest, you've got broadleaf coniferous, just that diversity. It also makes that landscape more resilient to pests or the next thing that uh, comes over in packing material if you don't have just a single species of trees of all one age. It's a much more resilient landscape. So how do we get there? This is where the nuance of this conversation gets really interesting because in the public we're talking about forests are going to be really important to sequester carbon, trees are really important. So we're going to talk about why we need to cut them. <laughs> this is like, this is really impossible. Um, but that in fact is what needs to happen and that starts to come into the, into the carbon sequestration models too. When you're harvesting those trees and that carbon is being sequestered for some amount of time, uh, potentially a century or more, depending on the building materials you're using, it really plays in to the sequestration models. So active management of our forests is going to be really important. The other important part of this, if we're going to end up with, and I don't even know what the estimates are, but just call it tens of millions of new forest acres, how are we going to purchase and support those new forest acres? They're going to have to be part of an economic model as we go forward. In other words, as the phrase has been coined by the Conservation Fund and Nature Conservancy, they're going to have to be working for us because otherwise what we're seeing happen here in Pennsylvania with uh, 300 some acres average per day is developed here and those forests are being lost we're going to need to find a way that landowners can maintain those forests and realize uh, some return on that investment. So 45 million acres of U.S. working forests are at risk of develop, development and fragmentation. Uh, this is really something interesting that's just popped up if you're, I'm sure all of you are paying attention to social media, but the importance of biodegradable packaging and getting away from plastics, both from the petroleum development of those products and the fact that they don't break down. So in that, the need for biodegradable packaging and the need for markets to keep working for us in forests and the ability to harvest some of those areas to have young forests mixed with old forests. Um, it's a pretty holistic model when you think about uh, forest management. And this really then, I believe, will be the solution going forward in uh, addressing climate change. Um, not to wrap up here before long, but you know, it just makes sense putting out a Leopold quote or two in here because nobody can say these things like Otto Leopold could. And it's really interesting that these are the things that he was saying in the 1930s, and they're still so relevant today. So we abuse land because we see it as a commodity. That's what happened around 1900. Uh, when we see land as a community to which we belong, we begin to use it with love and respect. So these early conservations weren't talking about locking lands away, setting them aside, and uh, not doing anything, preserving them. That was a more of a preservationist versus conservationist approach. And I think to solve a lot of the problems we're going to have going forward, conservation, wise, sustainable use, is going to be part of that answer. Um, just a note to leave you with when, remember when I was an, an undergrad in forest, forest and wildlife science at Penn State, I remember in, in class reading about these early conservationists, um, Rachel Carson and Marty Murray and Alan Leopold get the good show and Theodore and Roosevelt. And you see these black and white pictures and it's just kind of, they're like these mythical creatures. 
and you think, man, they had, you know, they were seeing entire landscapes completely cut uh, unsustainably, and they were seeing wildlife populations market hunted to near extinction. And these conservationists just, it was their time and they had their time. And we're not ever gonna be able to achieve this kind of greatness because you know, it was just their time. But I would argue that with climate change as we're seeing it now, uh, it is definitely time for the next generation of uh, really bold, don't take no for an answer kind of conservationists the need to step up, step up, not just to save forest resources and wildlife resources, uh, but quite honestly, to save ourselves as well. And I'll leave, I'll leave this picture up when we uh, have a discussion or questions here. So we can open it up for questions either from our online folks and uh, <clears throat> folks from the room. So the question was that with market hunting uh, and the, the things we were seeing around the 1900s over exploitation of forests that this carbon or this conservation movement picked up and why aren't we seeing people who are, are taking that lead now, right? Is that your question? Um, actually, it took a while. I've made the statement there, people who won't take no for an answer. There was a tremendous tide against what Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot were trying to do. Business interests were pushing back on them, whether it was timber, um, tremendous pushback. But for years, they built coalitions, they built political support, they explained the uh, patriotism, uh, how our country was founded on its natural resources, the importance of it going forward for our country, and over quite a long time they built support, but they, it was not easy for them, and it was a few of those leaders that really took off, because as the general public was not seeing it either at that time. Great question. Uh, what's your model for cutting down uh, the trees to uh, keep diversity and, you know, biomass stable? Um, mm -hmm. What would uh, what would happen if uh, natural uh, disturbances uh, began to you know, stabilize on its own? Would you stop the business model or would you quell the natural um, disturbances oh, man, that continue the business model? That is a great question. So when you're talking about balancing age classes and doing some sustainable harvesting over time, what happens if you have a major event, an emerald ash borer type of thing or something that kills a bunch of trees or a large tornado or something uh, that creates that young forest? You have to adjust plans at that point. You have to have flexibility built into your plans that we just got dealt a kind of a wild card here uh, that pushed our young forest up to this point in a big hurry, and now then we're gonna to have to adjust our harvest schedule over time to account for that. Now, interestingly, that is what would have historically, when Penn's Woods was all woods, that's what would have driven the diversity. There would have been fires, there would have been natural wind events, um, but today we've constricted that conserved land base so much that a wind event is more likely to wipe out a development or Walmart than it is to create young forest habitat. So the idea that you can just let nature take its course, set aside, and wind events and natural events will create the young forest, they're random events and they're not very likely to hit forests where we still have it. Great question, thank you. Russ. Um, so uh, yeah, really great presentation, Ben, thanks a lot. Um, and I. Uh, you, I want to go back to the question you posed at the very beginning um, with whether or not sportsmen would, would, would embrace climate change and, and, and kind of or be left behind. And I want to tie it into some, some news that I've heard recently um, of trends of declining numbers of hunters in many mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if um, you could talk a little bit about the kind of the 
the pressures on, on sportsman-based conservation groups with those declining numbers, and if maybe you see things like climate change as a way to, to bring people into the woods as, as hunters and conservationists, um, where we see like generational declines, maybe generational differences in, in, in the hunters. Oh, great. So uh, Russ's question, I try to roll that up with hunters really taking such a lead role as uh, the founders of conservation and hunters being so active in conservation over the decades, what do we do with the fact that hunter numbers are and have been declining uh, for some time? So the hunter recruitment piece is something that state wildlife agencies and groups like ours are really interested in. Um, for one, because the North American model is based on wildlife conservation is really funded by hunter dollars. Uh, our Pennsylvania Game Commission here, strictly funded by um, licensed dollars. There are no state general tax funds that come in there, so it's, it's hunter supported. So with the basis of that North American model, what do we do when that support base has been dwindling? And um, several things. A lot of it is there's been a cultural shift from an agrarian society where people were more connected to that kind of lifestyle. There have also been a couple of skipped generations where we weren't we weren't talking about hunting culturally as a lifestyle so uh, I think we've got a generation or two that was kind of missed in that so we're not just at this point targeting kids like I have kids 14 and soon to be 12 uh, but people in the age 20 to about 45 category and we're seeing a renewed interest in those groups because of the story about the North American model, but because also of uh, locavore food movements, the foodie scene is um, generating a lot of interest. Uh, the largest growing demographic right now in new hunters is actually women uh, as, as a way to get with like-minded people and to participate outdoors with their families. So we're seeing some really encouraging trends on that, but it's going to take a cultural shift. But the really thing, cool thing about cultural shifts right now with social media is they can happen in a few years, not decades and generations. So all of us who are in this soup are really working hard to talk more about what that is as a lifestyle and um, yeah, make that cultural shift. But it, it's an uphill climb us for sure. Yes. Um, so like Russ said, do you have any projects Working on right now, or that you are still that are like coming to the that maybe you think women should know about, and they're important because, um, like I heard a lot of talking about like, like taking down trees, that's like mm -hmm. this is currently happening in MCA. Like, I'm not kind of going there along that yeah so you're talking about locally things within yeah. Pennsylvania. Well, I think the one you could get engage on for sure would be the one on the Michelle. Yeah. And I'm uh, not all that up on the details there, but I'm sure there's lots of opportunity with that. We've got three landscapes that we're working on. Actually, um, I was in Washington, D.C. right before coming here, meeting with American Bird Conservancy leadership, and we're partnering with the American Bird Conservancy and Pennsylvania Audubon and several other groups, the Game Commission, on managing large landscapes in this way. So we're talking about tens of thousands of acres in these projects. Uh, one is the Pennsylvania Wilds Project that's in north central part of the state. So centered around say Snowshoe or Game Lands 100 if you want a reference point there. There's another one on the Delaware River in the Poconos and there's one that we just started in the Laurel Highlands and uh, centered in Somerset County. But I would say locally, the one on the Michelle would be one you could really get your hands into. And Roy Brubaker, their district forester there is fantastic. Yep. He'll find stuff for you to do for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ben. I have an online question. Oh, okay, great. You answered it somewhat as you were talking about your projects, but um, mm -hmm. how is your organization stepping up to combat the fossil fuel industry that is driving climate change yeah, where we're engaging in 
in a group like ours, you've got to stay focused on your priorities. And we've built over 60 years, uh, those priorities have been forest wildlife conservation. So we're working this from the side of, we're gonna make sure that there's a push to conserve more forest. We're gonna make sure they're working for us so we can get tens of millions of acres and that's gonna be our focus. Yes. So the, the Audubon map that you showed mm -hmm. is pretty sobering. Um, that, that showed the potential range contraction. Um, so I mean, is the American Rough Grouse Society going to turn into the Canadian Rough Grouse Society in a hundred years? You know, I mean, it, uh, will there be rough grouse in the U.S. in fifty years or hundred years? Well, the most frightening thing about that map to me is it started in two thousand, yeah. and already the first iteration. That's exactly what we're seeing. Yeah. So without action, there's no question that by twenty eighty. Um, let's see, it would be like my grandkids, I don't, yeah, grandkids or so, <laughs> by, by 2080, um, you're gonna have to go to, to Canada yeah. to see rough grouse, for sure. And already you're seeing it that, um, you talk about difficulties with recruiting new hunters, you know, kids that are growing up in Southern App Appalachians, like where I did my research in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, their father, family, always had bird dogs. They're yeah. trying to find grouse now and they're just not there. So that heritage is already being lost. Yeah. And it's really frightening because it's in, within a lifetime. The situation in Indiana where from the 1980s, I think besides white-tailed deer, uh, rough grouse were the uh, most hunted and harvested species in the state. They were that abundant. And within a lifetime, for them to be listed as endangered. And again, um, this wasn't a hunting issue, it's a habitat issue in Indiana. The seasons have been closed for several years, so it's not over hunting for sure. Question for um, are there, like, are there other examples of a species being like ubiquitous and abundant and then going to endangered regions in certain areas? Yeah, we've had them historically here and um, what it really talks about the East Hen. So it was an early successional species on all along the East Coast that uh, completely disappeared. I think those passenger pigeons, we had another obvious example. We were on the brink because of market hunting uh, with a lot of species. But if you look at these state wildlife action plans, uh, the trends that we've been talking about with rough grouse are the same trends that are occurring for a lot of species and just just a few weeks ago, this got a lot of press, but there was a science, an article in Science that talked about we've lost 2.9 billion birds in North America since 1970. So these issues are real, and it's not just one species, but entire suites. Yes? The project seen models that show that ground species in kind of in the north a few years. Did they have one for American Woodstock too? Yeah, so a couple questions there. One was uh, the map that we looked at with rough grouse. Is, does Audubon have one also for American woodcock? And I'm not sure if they do. I'd have to look. Yeah. And I'll follow up in a minute with, I think, the rest of that question, uh, how will climate change affect something like woodcock? And the other question was, are migration changes being noted related to climate? And that is definitely in the science, not just with woodcock, but with a lot of waterfowl, neotropical migrants as well. So you mentioned American woodcock. Um, they're listed in 28 state wildlife action plans. And uh, there isn't any question that climate change can have an impact there. Uh, let's just think of one potential example with woodcock would be right now, as they're migrating, they come down uh, and they, there's a little, they're, they're about this big short winged things and they migrate all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, sometimes flying 400 miles a night. 
So they stage up in places like Cape May, New Jersey. So if you get these off season nor'easters, for example, that dump 18, 24 inches of snow on a place like Cape May in November, it can have disastrous effects. Um, or any of, the, any of the hurricanes on the wintering areas in the south or changes in climate on the northern um, nesting and summer brood rearing areas, absolutely. Else? All right. Anything else online, Ben? They're quiet out there? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, thank you all very much. All right. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much.